It's a faux pas in some intellectual circles, mostly conservative ones, to say that there was a dark ages in European history. But the mainstream view, by contrast, has been that the Middle Ages were a dark period in Western history. What were these Middle Ages in the middle of? Well, between the Greco-Roman era and the Renaissance, roughly a millennium or a thousand years of time. The evaluative claim is that the glories of Greece and Rome and the achievements of the Renaissance and early modernity, those truly were outstanding. And by contrast, the Middle Ages look dimmer or actually dark. The mainstream view of the medieval is that life expectancy was low. Literacy was low and declining. People were by and large superstitious, ignorant of science and of the larger world around them. They had a fearful, stay-at-home mentality. They were scared of Judgment Day and scared of hostile natural world around them. Now, on this point, uh, historian Brian Ward Perkins, a fellow at uh, Oxford University, puts it this way in his The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization on the uh, scared of the world mentality. Quote, and as for trying to sail down the West African coast, everyone knew that as soon as you passed the Canary Islands, you would be in the sea of darkness. In the medieval imagination, this was a region of uttermost dread, where the heavens fling down liquid sheets of flame and the waters boil, where serpent rocks and ogre islands lie in wait for the mariner where the giant hand of Satan reaches up from the fathomless depths to seize him, where he will turn back in face and body as a mark of God's vengeance for the insolence of his prying into this forbidden mystery. And even if he should be able to survive all these ghastly perils and sail on through, he would then arrive in the sea of obscurity and be lost forever in the vapors and slime at the edge of the world. Now, the counterclaim by those who reject the Dark Ages is exactly that. There was no Dark Age. It's a travesty. It's a slander on the medieval era to speak of it so. There was lots of good stuff, great stuff in the Middle Ages. For example, here is Anthony Esselin, a professor at Thomas Moore College. Quote, far from the Dark Ages, which it is popularly called, the Middle Ages might be better described as the Brilliant Ages a startling epic of progress from science to art, from philosophy to medicine, unquote. Against those who say that there was a dark age, Professor Esselin and his fellow admirers of the Middle Ages will ask, well, what about X, Y, and Z? And here are the particulars. Let's talk about philosophers. Well, have you never heard of Thomas Aquinas, Maimonides, William of Ockham, Duns Scotus? And what about the universities, all those church schools blossoming into universities and new ones being added, Bologna, Oxford, Padua, Cambridge, Charles, Jagiellonian? What about the inventions of the black furnace, the printing press, the flying buttress, the mechanical clock, and so on and so forth? And what about art and literature, Dante, Chaucer, Petrarch, Boccaccio, etc.? So, who has the better of this argument? The deniers of the Dark Ages or those who insist that they were real and, in fact, quite dark? My understanding is that good historians break the medieval into two parts, from 400 CE to 1000, and then from about 1000 CE to 1500-year time periods. The 4 to 100 time period really was awful, and that's what the Dark Ages are about the next 500 years, that's where the debate really is and should be focused. Now, why, why those dates, 400 to 1500 or so? Well, we might start a little earlier, 312, Constantine, the emperor, controls Rome. He's the first emperor to be mostly pro-Christianity. 
around 325, he convenes the Council of Nicaea to try to formalize what Christianity stands for. Early and on through the 300s, we see the rise of monasticism, St. Jerome and St. Basil in the late 300s, a little bit later, St. Benedict. And the rise of monasticism is a strong signal of a withdrawal from the world. Around 410 is Alaric sacking Rome. St. Augustine was 56 years old when Rome was sacked. And a younger contemporary of his, Hypatia, is murdered by a mob of Christian monks. By the time we get to 529, the Emperor Justinian is closing all of the pagan university, including symbolically Plato's Academy. So that time stretch around 400 seems to be especially pregnant with a lot of dynamic cultural, intellectual, political change. Now we jump to a thousand years later, if we uh, see that as the bookmarking end of the Middle Ages, 1500 or so. Well, in 1492, Columbus is crossing the Atlantic Ocean. A couple of generations earlier, in the 1420s, Brunelleschi has built his giant dome in Florence. A generation later, also in Florence and Milan, we get Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo, Leonardo's younger contemporary, is starting out. Early 1500s, Copernicus is a young man. The Reformation is soon to break out. Martin Luther, John Calvin, and so on. So around 500, again, lots of significant events in the world is changing dramatically. Now, debate about the thousand years between, actually 1,100 years in between, 400 and 1,500. Let's uh, try to put some specific dates to the events here. So in your imagination, if you're listening on podcast, just imagine a timeline that stretches from the year 400 to the year 1500. And note in memory when the cited important events occur with the dates attached to them. Now this graphic, I've got a graphic made here, the timeline, I'll put it up at the open podcast site when this is published. All right, so to put some dates uh, to the names that were cited. So let's look at the philosophers. So Maimonides, Moses Maimonides, late 1100s. Roger Bacon, 1200s. Thomas Aquinas, 1200s. William of Ockham, 1300s. Duns Scotus, 1300. The universities, all those uh, church schools that, uh, that grew and developed. Bologna, apparently the first oldest university in Europe, founded 1088, so just before 1100. Oxford, early 1100s. Cambridge, early 1200s. Padua, early 1200s. Charles University, 1348. Jagiellonian, 1364. Major inventions, the blast furnace, sometime we think in the 1100s. The flying buttress, also in the 1100s. The mechanical clock, 1300s. The printing press, 1400s. What about literature? Well, Dante, early 1300s. Chaucer, 1300s. Petrarch, 1300s. Boccaccio, 1300s. Now, what should stand out from just those listed of dates by those who say there was no Dark Ages, here's all the good stuff that was going on in the Middle Ages, is all of that major activity starts in the 1100s, maybe a little bit late 10 hundreds, and picks up speed and steam in the metaphorical steam in the 12 hundreds, and then certainly more in the 1300s and 1400s. So the point is that all of the good stuff that the medieval apologists are citing come in the latter part of the medieval era, what's sometimes called the High Middle Ages. But the more important point is that there's little to nothing of significance happening from 500 to 1100 or so. Now just pause to think of that, 500 to 1100 or so, that's six centuries of relative nothingness, dark ages. So were there a dark ages? Well, yes. And the fall of Rome really was a crisis. You know, Rome was a mixture of good things, great things, and some awful things, but it was a civilization and it's falling apart really did usher in a dark era. Here's Brian Ward Perkins again. Quote, the mass of archaeological evidence now available, which shows a startling decline in Western standards of living during the 5th to 7th centuries. This was a change that affected everyone from peasants to kings. 
even the bodies of saints resting in their churches. It was no mere transformation. It was a decline on a scale that can reasonably be described as, quote, the end of a civilization, unquote. And just two more data points I want to put out there about the significance of the decline, one about literacy and one about engineering. As a result of the fall of Rome and the rise of uh, the Christian era, widespread illiteracy resulted. One significant data point here is the Emperor Charlemagne, late 700s, early 800s, uniting the East and the West, first Holy Roman Emperor. But Charlemagne himself was illiterate, right? Imagine being the head guy in Europe and being illiterate. And one of his common complaints was that he had a huge amount of correspondence to maintain his empire and hold it all together, but he just couldn't find enough scribes who were literate to keep up with his correspondence. That's significant. And about engineering, this is an anecdote from historian William Manchester who points out in the year 1500, the best roads in Europe in 1500 were roads that had been built by the Romans over a thousand years years ago. So that's really a thousand years of neglect, such that the best roads, obviously not in great condition, but nonetheless the best roads in a thousand years. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead, and his provocative account of master and slave moralities, and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claim that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so? Or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy to understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously, and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis, and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now, a related question here, though, is, and this takes us into one part of the debate, is that if there's not really much of anything going on from 500 to 11 or 100 or so, why did activity pick up? after the year 1000 or so? What caused the change? And I think, interesting, there's a number of things that are going on. One of them, I think, comes out of religion itself. If you put yourself in the mindset of a strongly religious person who believes in Judgment Day, and who believes that it is imminent from a close reading of uh, scripture, and you add a little bit of numerology to that, imagine the way you are thinking about the year 1000 as it approaches. So there you are in the year 900s, 960, 970, 980. It's getting closer and closer. The year 1000 is going to come, and it makes perfectly good sense to you that that's when the apocalypse is going to happen. Judgment Day is going to occur. But Of course, what happens is the year 1000 arrives and there is no apocalypse. There is no judgment day. So what do you do? Well, who knows when the apocalypse then is actually going to happen. Maybe it's time actually to pay attention to some more earthly, worldly concerns. So the failure of Judgment Day to arrive, you know, particularly now that we're getting to be about a thousand years after the death of Jesus, maybe we should put Judgment Day on hold and get on with business. So people did start getting on with business. Another uh, religious element, a religious motivated element, of course, is the Crusades, starting from around 1095 or so. But an unintended consequence here is that uh, this leads Western Europeans to have a lot more contact with non-Christians from other parts of the world. And so a significant amount of cultural exchange starts to occur. Europe opens itself up a little bit. 
1085 is a significant year with the fall of uh, Toledo. Uh, the Muslims are forced out of Spain and uh, Spain becomes uh, fully Christian again. And at Toledo and various other points, the Christians rediscover all sorts of Greek and Roman texts that had been lost to Western Europe, especially for many centuries. And curious minds start to read some of these texts and discover these magnificent civilizations that had existed long before and shockingly were not Christian. How was it possible that they could have achieved so much great stuff, but they didn't know the one true faith? And so much of the Renaissance that was then to come along in the next century or two was spurred by the rediscovery of these Greek and Roman materials. You know, the evidence of those magnificent civilizations brought a curiosity about what made them possible, and a lot of what seemed to make them possible didn't have very much to do with Christianity. And so the Renaissance itself was not a result of ideas that were developed within medievalism itself, but were rather a reimporting of some Southern European ideas into Europe almost a millennium later. But now let's go back to the other side, those who deny the Dark Ages or who are big fans of the Middle Ages. There's a retort here. Doesn't uh, the fact that, you know, Roger Bacon and Thomas Aquinas, both of them were religious men, doesn't that show that the church itself was pro-reason and pro-science? And so we don't need to have this opposition between superstitious dark ages and religious philosophy and more modern humanistic philosophy. Now here, absolutely, Aquinas is great, one of my top thinkers historically, uh, and he really is a major cause of the dark ages ending and our happy transition to the Renaissance. But the important thing here is that Bacon, Roger Bacon and Thomas Aquinas are active in the late 1200s. Their reintroduction of empirical modes of thinking do mark a healthy turning back to the natural world. But it's also important to recall that even though they were churchmen, in his prime, he and the others who were attracted to this newly discovered Aristotelian and other forms of pagan thought, they were threatened with excommunication, precisely on the grounds, the authoritative grounds, that such attempts to integrate Christianity with pagan classical thought, it tr threatens traditional, essentially Augustinian theology, the one that has been dominant and institutionalized now for about 800 years in Europe. And that dominant Augustinian Christian theology is very anti-empirical. It emphasizes revelation, mysticism, authority, and faith. Reason, to the extent that it is allowed, is severely subordinated. Minimization of empiricism or exclusion of empiricism is built into the tradition. Now, 1277 is an important year here. Uh, Aristotelian philosophy is explicitly condemned by the Bishop of Paris, this is Etienne Tempier, and by Roger Kilwardby at Oxford. So the official reactions to Aquinas, the emerging humanists, the early scientific thinkers like Copernicus, they were consistently negative, and it makes good sense on philosophical theological grounds. The message that the mainstream church was teaching in the 1200s was not, oh, go out and think for yourself, do your own research, trust your independent judgment, challenge us, ask the hard questions and so forth. Let's debate. Rather, it was still very much the opposite. They were still officially taking seriously all sorts of biblical passages. So I'll just cite 1 John 2 here. Quote, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. So we have a strong opposition between worldly interests and worldly concerns and otherworldly religious concerns. And it's really, even in the 1200s, still only a very few forward thinkers, as I like to think of them, Roger Bacon and Thomas Aquinas among them, who are opening that door to empiricism, opening the door to worldliness. Their followers then push that door wide open. The church's intellectuals consistently engaged in rearguard accommodation with empiricism and emerging science only when they lost the battles. Now, 
that's the history. But why is this history significant for today? As usual, our battles over history are not just battles over history. Our judgment about the Dark Ages really is significant for today's arguments over ideas and institutions. Join Professor Stephen Hicks on his Adventures in Postmodernism tour next March in Australia, where he'll be giving you his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Find out what makes postmodernism attractive. Why is it so dangerous? How has it evolved or mutated over the years? Does postmodernism have strong connections to neo-Marxism? What is the role of it in cultural wars, campus battles over free speech, political correctness, intellectual diversity, identity politics and the rise of Antifa and alternative right? What other political movements are now adopting postmodernism strategies and how do we resolve these issues of postmodernism? Stephen Hicks will be appearing in four major Australian cities throughout March 2019. He'll be doing an evening talk in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide and Brisbane starting at 7pm and will be holding an all-day special event masterclass series starting at 9am on March 10th in Melbourne and March 16th in Sydney where he will delve even deeper into understanding postmodernism, its history and teach you valuable strategies to actually combat it. For full details and to reserve your tickets today, go to truearrowevents.com. Select the event to which you would like to attend, and if you hurry, you may even be lucky enough to get your tickets at early bird prices at a 50% discount. And while you're online, please leave us a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. And the first one, the big one is, uh, what's our verdict on Christianity? For contemporary Christianians, there's a lot at stake because during the Middle Ages, Christianity was the dominant, if not the monopoly, intellectual and cultural power. Basically, Christianity had Europe to itself for over half a millennium, and Europe was stagnant during that time period. So, a standard interpretation, I think there's a lot of truth to this, is to say that the Dark Ages are a practical result of a reigning philosophy. And that counts as negative evidence against that philosophy. So the efforts by many Christian thinkers to deny that there was a dark age under their watch, that makes sense, even if it's not true. So here's a tendentious analogy. Religious thinkers who deny the dark ages, right, with all of the stagnation of life and devastation that they wrought, I think they're analogous to socialists who deny or whitewash the Soviet Union and China. It wasn't really socialism. Denial is not much different from it wasn't a dark age denial. Both of them are ideologically driven attempts to ignore uncomfortable historical evidence about the connection between theory and practice. Ideas matter. Now, a second, I think, important theme, though, is our verdict on modernity and the Enlightenment. And here again, religious conservatives tend to come to the fore. Because some prominent forms of contemporary conservatism hold that modernity is a mistake, or at least that it's a highly flawed human diversion from proper traditional values. Maybe the Enlightenment was partly good in the physical realm, but according to this version of conservatism, it has been a disaster in the moral, the social, and the political realms. Contemporary society is secular and rational. It's a product of the Enlightenment, but that is a bad thing. And what we need to do is return to pre-Enlightenment times, pre-modern times, when things were better morally and politically. So the Middle Ages, from this perspective, are used as a positive example to contrast with contemporary decadence. Now, let me name some names here. Here, for example, is William A. Rusher. He's a former publisher of the National Review, a leading conservative publication. Quote, today, sobered by a near century of world war and tyrannies with global ambitions, we, in the civilized West at least, appear to stand on the threshold of completing the Enlightenment project. Unquote. So notice the claim that Russia is making. The Enlightenment is responsible for war, tyranny, and ambitions of global conquest. That's pretty bad. 
Now here also uh, another prominent conservative. This is Irving Kristol, usually labeled as a neoconservative. Now he also argues that the 20th century has been a disaster, but he argues that that disaster is the consequence of, quote, secular rationalist humanism, unquote. So there we are, the hallmarks of the Enlightenment, humanism, rationism, and secular philosophy. Those are bad things. They caused the disaster that it is the 20th century. Another example, here's uh, Stephen J. Lenzer. He's a conservative research fellow at Claremont McKenna College, writing in The Weekly Standard, another mainstream conservative publication. The title of Lenzer's article that I'm quoting from is Two Cheers for Postmodernism. Now, notice postmodernism is typically in the first couple of its generations aligned with the far left, but here is a conservative finding common cause with them, at least you know, not three cheers, but at least two cheers for postmodernism. And Lenzer writes of, quote, the soul deadening effects of modern technological society, unquote. Now, note that the Enlightenment's prized technological achievements are pitted against spiritual values. And according to Lenzer, what we have is this either-or choice. Either we're going to be soul-enhanced spiritual people, or we're going to be modern technological people. Now, just as a sidebar here, I want to note that it's not only left-leaning postmodernists who oppose the Enlightenment. It's also strong right-wing or right-spectrum conservatives who reject it. And this is a theme that I'll be repeating frequently in this series. It's not only two choices that we face or two options that we have between a far left and a far right. We know of the postmodern left that rejects the Enlightenment and wants to go in this postmodern direction, or that we have to choose between them and a right that's also rejecting the Enlightenment and wants to go back to a pre-modern time. There is a principled third alternative, Enlightenment, modern liberalism that rejects both of them. But let's return to this theme of conservatives against modernity. Here's another professor, Professor Ernest Vendehag, formerly at Fordham University, talking about the Enlightenment and its legacy and the emptiness that it, uh, that it led to. So here's the quote. Reason did not fill the emptiness left by the destruction of religion. It built no cathedrals, created no faith. We find ourselves alone in the desolation of reality. There he's quoting Camus. The philosophes never realize that reason can destroy a community, but that only religion can create it. So, since relying on reason does not guarantee that everybody's going to think that the same things are reasonable, the argument Van den Haag goes on to make, the absence of a unifying set of beliefs based on a faith or a tradition is just going to lead to disputes being settled by force. Absolutely, then, the Enlightenment leads to violence, and what we've seen in the 20th century has been violence. Again, a sidebar. Notice that this is very close to arguments made by far leftists of the Frankfurt School, Adorno and Horkheimer in their 1947 dialectic of enlightenment. So what we have then is conservatives who start off with a reverence for tradition find themselves disquieted right, by modernity's deep liberalism and its diversity. They find they have a distaste for modernity's secularization. Society, they think, really is going to hell morally and politically. So they have a soft spot for the good old days. Back in the day when there was a hierarchical society, when there was a uniform set of beliefs and particularly a universal religious set of beliefs. And that's exactly what we find in the medieval era. So from this perspective, we need to return to the medieval era and we need to think of it as a good time, not a dark age. Now, just uh, before I close, I want to mention that there is a third form of conservatism here that's more moderate than the one I just mentioned here. And it holds that modernity is not so bad, so we should accommodate it, but we should try to blend the achievements of the Enlightenment, the achievements of modernity with the best of the old pre-modern conservative tradition. So the goal of this form of conservatism, when it does its history, is to try to find 
find the origins of the good stuff in the medieval era and to try to claim that it was the medieval era that made possible those good things and that there is therefore a continuity between the religious philosophy of the medieval era and the modern enlightenment develops pro-science, pro-technology that followed. Now, I'm going to disagree with that. My view is that really the dominant ideas of the Middle Ages do not get any of the credit. Those ideas, that is to say the dominant ideas of that era were otherworldly, they were faithful, they were superstitious, and they were authoritarian. They caused and maintained stagnation for over 600 years. It was only once Europe made serious contact with non-European cultures and that it re-imported and rediscovered the classic Greek and Roman civilizations. That's when the break from stagnation began. The Renaissance and the Enlightenment that followed were born of a break with the religious culture that had dominated the Middle Ages and did indeed cause a dark age. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favourite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher.